good to be a child of the King this morning. I want to invite your attention to James chapter 1 today. James chapter 1. And uh, this morning we're going to be talking about temptation, or rather James, uh, God through James talks to us about temptation. Uh, But here, James moves from temptation in the sense of a trial of our faith uh, to a a sense of enticement to sin. That's what this word tempted means uh, in our text this morning. And so today as we look at temptation and as we think about that, Uh, We want to answer a few questions this morning. Number one, we want to answer what is the source of temptation to sin? Uh, Where does temptation to do evil come from? Why does temptation turn to sin? And just whose fault is it anyway? That's what we're going to answer uh, this morning. Let's stand together, if you're able, uh, to read in our text today, James chapter 1 and verse 13. James says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved Brethren, Let's bow together this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask you that you'd help us in this service. Lord, we pray that you would just, your Holy Spirit would just move freely in our midst today. And God, we pray that you would work in the hearts of the people that are gathered here this morning. Help us uh, to understand temptation and help us as we study this passage of Scripture today. And Father, I pray if there's one person here that's lost and they don't know you as their Savior, that today would be the day that their eternity changes. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. As we look into this text this morning, uh, we, we find this idea of temptation. And if you have been here the, the last few Sundays, uh, you'll know that James has talked about being tempted before. But what he's talked about in those other verses leading up to this point has been a trial of our faith. It is when God puts us to the test. Now he moves to this word. It is the same word in our English Bible, uh, but it means a little something different. It doesn't mean the trial of our faith here, but it means an enticement to sin. And you say, well, how do you know the difference in those words? Well, it depends on the context around the, the word temptation. But temptation in this sense is the desire or the craving to do wrong. Do you have that in your flesh this morning? You better be honest in the church house today. We all have a desire, a craving to do something that may harm us, to do something that is evil, to do something that is sinful, to do something just plain out wrong. And this temptation, this word means a craving so strong that we can hardly resist. We can hardly stand it. Uh, That's what temptation means. It is the desire for more and more. And listen, the desire of a good thing more and more can eventually turn into a bad thing. And so temptation to sin is common to us all, isn't it? From the youngest person to the oldest person here, we all have a temptation to sin. From the most mature person here to the most immature person here, uh, we all have this desire to sin. And we have this idea in our mind, if we can just create a perfect environment and live in some type of bubble and take away and remove all temptation, then that'll deal with the temptation problem. I want you to understand, uh, if, even if we do that, we still will have temptation as humans. We still have the temptation to sin. We're still prone to temptation. And so in this text, we're not told how to avoid temptation, but how to overcome temptation. Just hit that top button or that button. It must have quit on me. Okay, about the last time I'm going to deal with that thing. 
All right, where was I at here? We're not told how to avoid temptation in this text, but we're told in this text how to overcome it. And uh, a little boy, I, I read an illustration of a little boy, and this little boy loved cookies, as most little boy uh, boys do. And uh, his mom made some cookies for him, and she said, you cannot eat any until after you've had lunch. Well, those cookies were sitting up there on the counter, and they were still warm, and that aroma filled the house of those sugar cookies. And uh, the mom came back in and found him enjoying one of those sugar cookies. And she said, I thought I told you you couldn't have one till after lunch. What in the world's going on? He said, well, Mom, I was just going to smell them, but my teeth got caught. <laughs> Isn't that how? <laughs> Listen, from an early age, we learn how to blame our sin and our wrong on something else or someone else, don't we? We don't have to be taught how to blame. We love the blame game. We love to blame everything on everyone else. And so no one has to teach us how to blame someone else. I want you to notice three things with me in this text on temptation to sin. First of all, notice the source of temptation. And James begins in verse 13, and he tells us what the source is not. He says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. James comes right out, real plain, and he says, let no man say, evidently some that he is writing to, some were blaming God because of their sin. Some were blaming God because of their bad choices. But what God tells, what James tells us here is blaming God for our sin is off limits. Be careful what you say. Be careful when you blame someone else or when we blame God for our wrongdoing because what we say comes out of the well of our heart man speaks. That's what the Bible says. But notice he says, let no man say, notice this, when he is tempted. Do you get that? He doesn't say, let no man say if he is tempted. He says, let no man say when he is tempted. Temptation is going to come. And so this means an enticement to sin. God does not produce this kind of temptation. But some Bible scholars may say, but wait a minute, preacher. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1, the Bible says that God tempted Abraham. Yes, but again, the context of that temptation, right? The context of Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1, it was a trial of his faith. It was not an enticement to sin. Listen, God does not entice us to sin. God doesn't want us to sin. God doesn't, so, so the source of that is not from God. And our nature is to blame others when we sin. We love the blame game, don't we? Don't get quiet on me now. Genesis chapter 3. Look at the very beginning of this deal in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 12. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and uh, they are tempted by the serpent. And, and look down to verse 12. After they've committed the sin, God comes walking in that cool of that day, and he says, where are you? Why are you hiding from me? Who told you you were naked? Look in verse 12. And the man said... That woman. Pretty good preaching, right? That woman. The man said, notice what he says, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Now, who was really, who really was Adam blaming here? He said, that woman you gave me, but really, ultimately, God's the one who gave to, to, uh, to Adam, gave Eve to him. And so he is really, he's blaming God here in the very beginning of the word of God. He is blaming God. And listen, there, there are those today we think, well, it's my parents' fault. That's why I sinned. It's my teacher's fault. That's why I sin. It's, it's the environment that I live in. That's why I sin. It's the devil's fault. The devil made me do it. Listen, we give the devil more credit than he's due. And we say, well, the devil made me do it. Or my wife, it's her fault. Or my brother, it's his fault. Or maybe sometimes we even say, God, it is your fault because you have set all of these things up and you set all of these things in motion. But James says, no, we cannot blame God for our wrongdoing and our sin. Why? Well, consider his character. 
You know, right now, angels are gathered around the throne and they're singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Consider the character of God when we say, well, God has allowed this and this is why I sin. Consider his holy character. And when we are blaming our sin on God, we're attacking the character of God. Listen, God is in one rim. Evil is in another rim. And they, are, they don't cross. God is holy. He is on another plane. And notice what James says in verse 13. He says, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Why? Because he is holy and he is perfect and there is no temptation that gets at God. There's nothing that brings him away. And notice what he says, neither tempteth he any man. He doesn't tempt us to sin. Uh, 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 temptation has no appeal to Almighty God, and He cannot tempt us with sin. His character doesn't desire that we sin. And so listen, He is in control of all things. He allows all things, but He is never responsible for our sin. Notice where the blame should fall. Notice the source, the true source of our sin in verse 14. But every man, notice that, but God's not the source, but he says every man is tempted when he is drawn away of what? His own lust. And so James says, look, here's the, here's, here is the true source. It is in ourselves. It's not about the environment that we find ourselves in. It's not about God doing something and causing us to sin. It's not even about Satan doing something and causing us to sin. It's not anybody else's fault. Listen, he says, when we sin, we must own responsibility for it. Y'all with me? Amen. We must own responsibility for our sin. And maybe there's some here this morning, you've got unconfessed sin in your life. Listen, you can't walk with God like God desires with unconfessed sin in your life. And so when we sin, we have to own it. The devil didn't make me do it. My wife didn't make me do it. No one else made me do it. God certainly didn't make me do it. We choose to sin at the end of the day. We choose to sin. We choose to go with the temptation. And so what James is saying is this, the problem doesn't lie without, but the problem lies within me, my own lust, my own lust. And James then moves and gives us the anatomy of sin, the progression of temptation and sin. Notice secondly in this passage of scripture, the scope of temptation the scope of temptation, it begins with a desire. Look again in verse 14. He says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, let me say this. Just the fact that we are tempted to sin is not sin. Jesus was tempted by Satan. But Jesus never committed any sin. But notice it begins with a desire. He says, when he is drawn away, of his own lust. That word drawn, that phrase drawn away, that is a picture word. And it, the picture is to lure away, kind of like a fishing bait does. You know how you throw up beside that log? And uh, you, you, that buzz bait is coming through the water and everything is just right and, and the bait is shimmering and the bait looks so good. By the way, there's, there's some baits I don't understand why a fish will hit them and bite, but they will. But what happens? What you're trying to do is draw that big old bass out from underneath that stump to come out of that safety place and catch a hold of that bait. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to draw them away from that place of safety. Listen to what temptation does to us. It is trying to draw us away from our place of safety. It is trying to, it is trying to draw us away. And this drawn away also has the idea of the seduction of a harlot. And notice what he says. He says, lust here. He says in verse, in verse 14, when he is drawn away of his own lust. Now, immediately, what's the only thing we think of when we hear the word lust? All we think about is sexual impurity, sexual Im immorality. Immorality. 
But I want you to understand this is a much larger word, the word lust. It could be a lust for money. It could be a lust for popularity. It could be a lust for prestige. It could be a lust for position. It could be a lust for possessions. For even recognition, we want to be noticed. We want to be recognized. But notice he says, of your own lust, you're enticed. The word entice means to lure. It means to entrap. And isn't that a powerful display of the deceitfulness of lust? Drawn away out of safety. And then enticed to entrap. That's what sin does to us, isn't it? Sin entraps us. Sin, it, it draws us out. And it, it, we, we think it's a great idea. And listen, I wouldn't be much of a preacher. I wouldn't be a Bible preacher if I didn't tell you this morning, sin is fun. Isn't that the truth? The Bible says that we can enjoy the, 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 uh, the, the fun of sin. But it also goes on to say that it only lasts for a season. The pleasure of sin uh, is fun, but it only lasts for a season. Listen, just like the bass doesn't know there's a hook in that bait that he goes after, I want you to understand this. When we are drawn away of our lust and when we sin, there is always a hook in it. We always lose. We always lose. Listen, it's best to stop it right here. Because if we don't stop it in verse 14, here's what's going to happen in verse 15. Notice it, this development. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. When lust has conceived, and now he moves to the metaphor of childbirth. Lust is pictured as a mother conceiving and bearing a child. And when does that happen? When is lust conceived? When my, sin, when my desire is acted on. When my desire is acted on, uh, there is going to be sin. There's going to be a birth. Impregnated lust bears a child which is sin. And when we allow ourselves to follow our desire to be drawn away, sin is always the result. So we've got to stop it at desire. We must stop it. We must deal with it right here. We can deal with it, can't we? Listen, we don't have to succumb to our temptations, do we? We can overcome temptations by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can overcome temptation by the Holy Spirit of God. Listen, you can overcome it today. I didn't say it's easy. I said it's possible. It's possible. Listen, there will be a birth. Maybe a lust for power. Maybe a lust for prestige. Maybe a lust uh, for any type of desire. But notice that's not even the end, is it? The, in this development, it begins with a desire. It moves through development, but it ends with death. Look in verse 15. He says, when lust hath conceived... There's going to be a birth. It bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The word finish there means when, it, when sin is accomplished, when sin is performed, when sin is brought to completion. And listen, if that big bass would have looked beyond the bait and saw and knew that there was a hook in that bait, he wouldn't have been on the dinner table that night. What happened? He couldn't take it. He tried to resist, but he couldn't take it. And he went after the bait and there was a hook in the bait and he's reeled in and there was a death, unfortunately, for the fish. But death, notice this, the child is dead at birth. Sin brings death, doesn't it? Paul agreed with that, didn't he? Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is physical death that it brings. It is spiritual death that sin brings. And even eternal death, separation from Almighty God. That's what sin brings. That's the wages of sin. You remember when God told Adam, the day you eat of the fruit of that tree, what will happen to you? You will surely die. Now, Let's, let's talk about that. Payment for sin doesn't always come due immediately. 
But know this, y'all, it will always cost us. The bill always comes due. And immediately what happened when they ate that fruit, in the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, what happened immediately when they ate that, sin was conceived, sin was born, and immediately they died spiritually. They were separated from God, just like the Bible says. There is a death. Sin brings death. But think about it long term. The human race plunged into condemnation. Adam and Eve eventually died physically. The human race died. They, they, they were plunged into condemnation and death and separation from God. And so it's best we stop at that desire. Because if it develops, it's go, it, it is going to get us. That's how sin happens. And then thirdly, I want you to notice in this text the straying of temptation. This, this verse 16 is what is known as a hinge verse. It can go with what is said before and it can go with what follows in, in either context. But it refers to, to both of those things. But notice the proclamation in verse 16. He says, do not err, my beloved brethren. That word err means to be led astray. He's saying you don't have to do that. Don't be led astray. Don't be deceived. And he goes on in the next verse, in verse 17, and he talks about how God only gives good gifts because he's only a good God. Amen. We'll get into that next week, Lord willing. But listen, right here, he's saying, know that God is good. Know that God is holy. Know that God is not the source for my sin. Know the source, the true source lies within me. Know the scope of sin, the progression of sin, and the results of sin. He's saying, don't err, don't be led astray, don't be deceived, but know how all of this goes on. And then notice the possibility. We can overcome temptation to sin. It's possible. It's possible Christ, our greatest example, Christ was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, what do you think? He was hungry. He was hungry. He was, he was at a vulnerable moment. He had gone 40 days and 40 nights without anything. He's up here in the wilderness without anybody. And Satan tempted him with evil. And three times Jesus answers him with this. It is written. It is written. And he used the scriptures. He used the word of God to combat this temptation to do evil. This temptation to sin. How do we overcome temptation to sin? Well, we get our mind on God. You know how that is, don't you? You know how that thought comes into your brain? Man, you crave something and you desire it and it's wrong and it's sinful. Listen, if you can get your mind right there, if you can get your mind off of that and on to Almighty God and, and, uh, and go to Him in prayer and concentrate on His Word, that's what Jesus did. Concentrate on His Word. We can overcome temptation. To sin. But listen, if we're drawn away to our lust and we give in to that, we chase it like that fish does that lure. When we do that, lust is conceived and brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That's the word of God today. But here's the thing we don't have to yield to that. We don't have to stray to temptation. We don't have to err. Or he wouldn't say, don't err, my beloved brethren. We, but here's, here's the thing this morning. We must stop blaming others. We've got to stop blaming others. For our, Listen, our sin, your sin is not your parents' fault. <laughs> your sin is not your teacher's fault. Your sin is not... The devil's fault. Yeah, he can line it all up, but he can't, he can't make us sin. Here's the thing about it. God is not the problem when it comes to my sin. Satan is not the problem when it comes to my sin. Others are not the problem when it comes to my sin. 
The only place I can look is in the mirror. We are responsible for what we do. We are responsible for our actions. It is our own lust. And so three things I want to leave you with this morning. Acknowledge the source of sin. Don't blame God. Acknowledge the source of sin. Understand how temptation works and why we sin. And then confess sin quickly. As we get ready, let's have a song of invitation this morning. Get, let's get right with God. Listen, maybe you're here this morning and maybe you say, Preacher, I have failed God miserably. Preacher, I've taken the bait and there was a hook in it. What do I do now? Well, the thing about it, God's not through with you. God's not through with you. Well, what do we do there? What do we do when we have sinned against God? What do we do when we are in the wrong and we have, we have been lured away of our own lust? What do we do? Well, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 tells us what to do. Look at it. Don't let sin beat you down this morning. We're sinners, and we need a Savior. We're sinners, and after we're saved, we still fail the Lord. But notice what he says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. To forgive us our sins. Do y'all believe that today? Amen. Don't, don't walk out of here with that sin weighing you down when you can let it, let it go right here in this altar. Listen, the Lord will forgive us. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 says.